studies in this group of course Peter then as we finish our studies in Genesis of course the Latin verses so we're in first Peter today this is our new study first Peter is obviously after James towards the end of the scriptures first Peter there's five chapters in it it's a great epistle there's so much that you know, we can learn from it over the next number of months as we search and um, zoom in on these wonderful words of Peter, of course, inspired, superintended by the Holy Ghost. So we're just going to read the first three verses of Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God's Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and strengthening of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. And the Lord will bless these two verses to us today. Down through the ages, true Christians have suffered in all generations because of their allegiance to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord told us, and there's many, many, many verses in Scripture, of course, I am not labor on it for time's sake, but the Lord says, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Paul reminds us that you will enter, enter the kingdom of God, you will go through much tribulation. So the scriptures were not quack or obscure recording what we have to suffer to enter the kingdom. Of course, suffering in itself does not give us salvation. But because we live in a fallen world, we live in a evil world, a sinful world, a world which is on a collision course, it is on death row, on a collision course with Almighty God. God's people have suffered and will suffer right up until the Lord returns in blaze and glory. Because this world is an enemy of God, it's an enemy of the gospel, it's the enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some have suffered in many forms, such as physical, mental, spiritual. Some have been beaten, some have been stoned to death. Some have been put in jail, some have been executed. Some have been fed to the lands. Some have been persecuted, cast away, disowned by families, made unemployed, treated unjustly, falsely accused, mocked, treated with malice, as being the filth of the world. Peter was the author of this epistle, and his purpose was to offer encouragement, inspiration to suffering Christians to press on. And I trust this afternoon, dear friend, that you are pressing on towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're in the West, we have different temptations compared to probably some in the East. Yes, some in the East are even damned physically for the cause of Christ. We are more, our, our minds are being hammered, oppressed, tempted by the enemy. So we suffer in a different capacity than some Christians in the East. But we all suffer. We go through trials, we go through tribulations. The devil hits us with fiery darts. He tries to oppress us. He tries to get us to doubt God's word. He tries to shatter our faith. He tries to rob us of our joy, strike fear in the poor us, so we will become ineffective believers. So Peter wrote this epistle to offer inspiration, to offer encouragement to suffering Christians to continue on, to press on. And how could he do this? Well, we're going to look at 
program was trying out in three minutes. The key, why we can press on, why can we can even rejoice, as Paul rejoiced even in the prison cell in Rome. Rejoice in the Lord always, and say rejoice. Peter was like in Rome when he wrote his this letter around AD 63. Now I must mention Peter did not plant the church at Rome or serve as its first bishop. The church of Rome was more than likely planted after Peter's sermon at Pentecost. You see there was Jewish proselytes. Um, they were Gentile believers who were, who were worshipping the religion of Judaism. And as a result then Peter preached at Pentecost and God converted them. And some went back to Rome. That is more than likely how the church of Rome was accomplished. And then the Apostle Paul went to Rome before Peter, because Paul did not build on any other man's foundation. So Peter did not plant the church at Rome, no matter about the Roman Catholic Church, the Trace Italian, or serve as its first bishop. Peter likely arrived in Rome after the Apostle Paul's first release from imprisonment around the year A.D. 62. You see, Peter and Paul were in Rome when the great persecution began under the Roman current evil emperor called Nero. Paul was martyred around A.D. 64, unlikely Peter a short time after. Throughout the Roman Empire, believers were being tortured and executed for their faith in Jesus Christ. While the church in Jerusalem was being scattered throughout the Mediterranean world, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Jesus had given Peter a special ministry before the Lord ascended back to glory, which was the cure for the church by feeding the lambs as a shepherd tending the flock. Peter and Paul were the two prominent leading apostles in the early church, as the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts is mainly dedicated to the ministry of Peter. In fact, the Lord gave Peter the keys of the kingdom, a force as he brought the gospel to the Jews of Pentecost, when 3,000 were wonderfully converted, and then another, a number of 2,000 or so were converted at Solomon's porch, then Peter was the one the Lord used to go to the Samaria, and then also to the Gentiles in Cornelius' house in Caesarea. So Peter brought the gospel to the Jews first, then the Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles. So the purpose of this magnificent epistle was addressed to believers to encourage them with great hope as their suffering would soon intensify under that evil current Nero. Throughout the centuries, this epistle of Peter's wise counsel on encouraging words of hope and comfort have been a great benefit to many believers. And yet, sadly, we have ecumenicalism, which is from the pit of hell, deceiving multitudes by their fair speeches to fill their own belly. And our forefathers, which were burned at the stake, many of them, for our freedom, just like these apostles. And yet, many are going back in, in the darkness. Peter's desire was that believers would stand firm in the true grace of God despite persecution and suffering. As he reminded them of their election, which we're going to look at in a minute in verse 2, and sure hope of their heavenly inheritance, which far outweighed all temporary trials, temporary sufferings, 
temporary persecutions as it is only a light affliction compared to the eternal way of glory. The Lord says, Don't fear them that kill the body, but rather fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. Peter was reassuring and comforting them as they were so privileged being chosen by God and being partakers of Christ's suffering. Why a crown of glory that fadeth not away awaited them? The future was bright. Despite their persecution, despite their suffering, it was only, it was only temporary. It's not compared to eternity. We're only here, dear friends, for a very short, minimal time or time during God's hand. No of us know even when I will even make it to tomorrow. But eternity is forever and ever and ever. Your soul will live forever, either in glory on heaven, because you're saved, because your sins are forgiven, because there came a time when God convicted you and brought you to that point of repentance, and you repented and received Christ as Savior, and your sins are forgiven, and you're a child of His, and you're going to glory. Or folks, your soul will consider us in love, your soul will end up in the lake of fire, hell, a place of unquenchable fire and with God's perfect justice and judgment. Because you've held on to your sin. The penalty of sin, you see, always leads to death. But thank God Jesus Christ has paid the price for sin. Have you availed? Have you appropriated? Are you in Christ? Do you know your sins are forgiven? Or are you still holding on to your sin? This is critical. This is vital. Are you going to glory? Are you sure that your sins are forgiven? That you belong to Christ? If you die tonight, you're going to heaven. There's a crown of glory that faith not away awaiting you. Are you after God's great eternity? Empty handed, completely shamed under God's wrath. You see, dear friends, Peter was assured and comforting these believers who were scattered, they were made the Jews. But it speaks to all believers in every age. They were scattered because of the persecution. And Peter was inspiring them, comforting them, encouraging them to show them that they were so privileged because of them chosen by God, which we're going to zoom in on in a wee minute in verse 2. And the Bible reminds us, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All. Some more degrees than others, of course. It's the cross. Jesus, you see, never manipulated anyone. Jesus was always transformed. It's the cross first and then the crown. It's suffering and then glory. But yet many want the code of church, that's fine, that's good, that's commendable, it's great to say everyone today, but there's many go to church today across this province, across this world, and they're only church goers, they're in the flesh, they're not in the spirit, they're not saved, they think by religious works or whatever works they want to, they want to put a uh, mansion, that they think that they can make their peace with God and they're being absolutely deceived, duped. They want to go to heaven but get no cross. The Lord says, if any man or woman come up to me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me daily. Well, as we suffer at times by taking up our crosses, we must remember that Christ is both our hope in the midst of suffering and our example of how to endure suffering faithfully. God's grace, you see, if suffering or trials come or persecution comes, whatever it may be, God's grace is sufficient for every situation. And folks, we can even rejoice in our trials for His glory because it's supernatural, God's Spirit in us. At the beginning of this powerful letter, it is remarkable that Peter starts with the doctrine of election. In verse 2. To encourage. Why did he do this? Why is this so important? 
It was to encourage the scattered saints due to persecution, their privilege, their calling and position in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see your position in Christ, when temptation comes, and the devil's trying to have a flash in you, and the devil's <coughs> using temptation to try and get you lure you into sin. Folks, see your position in Christ. Ask yourself a question. I don't do that no more. I'm in Christ. And Peter's basically putting a picture of these people here, these scattered Jews, because of persecution. He was reassuring them. He was encouraging them. He was inspiring them. Because they've been elected, chosen by God, keep going. God has called you and he will keep you. Verse 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit and the obedience and strengthening of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Peter does not shy away, hesitate, or apologize by writing in his opening remarks one of the most controversial and hated doctrines, which of course is alluded to throughout the scriptures. Whatever angle you want to go down tonight or today, folks, God, election is paramount and throughout the scriptures. Thank God he's called you, he's chosen you. That's all for us. Sovereign election, as God is sovereign over salvation, not man. Sadly, over many years, it has crept into the church a man centered gospel instead of Christ centered. And Jesus said, I don't want to go through a multitude of verses. But nevertheless, Jesus said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now, whatever way you want to work it out in the mechanics and the nuts and the bolts, that's all right. If you're saved today, folks, you're chosen by God. You're elected by God. Jesus says, No one can come to me except the Father which has sent me to him. First of all, we can discover the recipients Peter addresses regarding the right of action here. Verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are the recipients Peter addresses regarding the right of action. This letter is primarily addressed to Jewish Christians scattered in these regions because of persecution. Don't forget, folks, salvation is of the Jews. We're why promises are brought to them. And the first believers and leaders of the early church were Jews. God's people should be praying for, for Israel. Boast not again the national bronzes, Roman says. The Jews were the first evangelists and mysteries. It was through the Jews that we benefit now with this book. It was Paul who brought the gospel to Europe. Paul is a Jew, a Jew of a Jew, a tribe of Benjamin. Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said. The Jews were the first evangelists and mysteries. Jesus was a Jew, and so were the apostles. Why some Jews were converted 3,000 or so as Peter preached in the day of Pentecost, they did not give up their heritage just the same as when we became Christians, we did not give up our nationalities. The very early church which mainly consisted of converted Jews were considered to be strange in the eyes of the world in verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius. Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You see, true Christians have standards and values different from those in the world. We're strange, you see, in the eyes of the world. And of course, we're strange in the sense we're pilgrims, we're only passing through this world. Our true citizenship, you see, is in glory. But we're also strange in the eyes of the world. We don't do those things we used to do. 
True Christians, Mary, true Christians have standards and values. Not hypocrites. The company is full of them. Profess salvation and they're not even in. And they bring shame to the name of Christ. But you see, true Christians have standards and values different from those in the world. They have a different lifestyle which can trigger off opposition, persecution, as we are meant to be sought and light and live body lives. These Jewish believers were scattered people in strange places. They were scattered in five different parts of the Roman Empire, specifically in Asia Minor, which in today's language is Turkey, modern Turkey. Pontius in verse 1. It was far north in Asia Minor. Modern Turkey, which was the home place of Aquila, who ministered with the Apostle Paul. Also, there was Jews from Pontius in the day of Pentecost, which heard Peter preach and were likely converted and brought the gospel back to that place. Then we've got Asia, which was in Central Asia Minor, modern Turkey, which contained the towns of Derby, Lystra, Iconium, where the Apostle Paul ministered on different occasions. Then we have Cappadocia, in verse 1, which was located in the eastern part of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, in which pilgrims heard Peter preach on the day of Pentecost. Then we have Asia, which was located in the western side of modern Turkey, in which Paul ministered extensively during his third missionary journeys in Lydia, Mysia, etc. And then we have Parthenia, it says here, which was located in northwest of Asia Minor, which is only mentioned only once more in the New Testament, in which the Holy Spirit during Paul's second missionary journey forbid him, told him not to enter into it. These geographical areas Peter mentioned have a very wide circulation. As the churches would have received and read the letter Peter wrote. In these areas there was churches in Colossae. There was churches in Ephesus. There was churches in Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, in the regions of Asia Minor, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. These were all in this area, modern Turkey, Asia Minor, in which the regions of Asia Minor, in which Peter's epistle would be so beneficial to them in the midst of suffering and hardships, knowing they were chosen by God, which gave them confidence to face persecution and triumphant hope. Today, folks, in your sea rejoice, the Lord has set his love on you. God loves the world. He's given. He gives us sunshine. He gives us rain. He gives us good things to enjoy. But God, folks, has set a special love, an everlasting love on his people. Rejoice today if you're saved in the grace of God. And it gave them inspiration. It gave them encouragement. The press on. Because Peter told him, you are chosen by God. Paul said, or the Hebrew writer reminds us, let us run with patience and endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What an inspiration! What an example Jesus Christ is. The Lord didn't give up. The Lord pressed on. He still wanted to go to that crew across the shame of it. As he took our condemnation, our damnation, our corruption, our perversion, our hell, put whatever what such humiliation. But he seen he seen beyond the cross. He seen the joy set before him. He knew he was going back to heaven, the glory. It was a cross first and then glory. So being strangers, pilgrims on this earth, as our true citizenship is in heaven, having newness of life in Christ, passing through, but yet God, we're here folks today because God has saved us, God has called us under himself, we're in his bride, we are, we are his people, we are children of light, 
we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And um, we are still here, folks, to serve him and to glorify him. But yet we long, we desire to be with the Lord, our master, our savior, our king, our captain, our elder, our brother, and the father of head and glory. As Peter reminds us in verse 4, because we're going home to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fate of not away reserved in heaven for you. What comfort were these words to Peter to these suffering Christians? He told them they were chosen, he told them they were elect, but also he tells them, keep pressing on because heaven awaits you. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fate of not away reserved in heaven for you. What an inspiration for anyone who's no greater. You belong to God. God is your heavenly Father. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. And you know you're going to glory. God has a place reserved in heaven for you. Personal. What comfort. What security. What encouragement. What a prospect that waits the children of God. No matter what we have to go through in this world. What motivation. What inspiration. What guarantee that is for the elect of God as the ultimate future is bright being saved by the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. And Paul reminds us, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Folks, rejoice today. You didn't choose God, God chose you. But that does not undermine the responsibility because the Bible does not teach both God's election but also teaches God's responsibility, man's responsibility. I cannot work it out, no preacher or no one can work it out, even the greatest theologians learned through the generations of the church cannot work it out. But the Bible does preach both doctrines, God's elect, but also preaches man's responsibility. But who shall lay the charge of God's elect is the question. It is God that justifies. Notice here the first word in verse 2 is elect, which means chosen, it is eglatos. Peter affirms us by stating, but you are a chosen generation, who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God, many examples we could give you. God chose Abraham. Abraham didn't come to God. Abraham was a beggar and sinner. God chose Moses. Moses didn't come to God at the burning bush. God chose David. God chose Jeremiah even before he was even born, the Bible says. God chose Saul of Tarsus, who became the apostle Paul. Paul wasn't coming to seek Jesus Christ. No, he was apprehended and arrested in the road of Damascus. Folks, rejoice. Jesus says, you haven't chosen me, but I've chosen you. Nobody deserves it. That's all the grace. Paul says to the Thessalonians, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren and beloved of the Lord, because God from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. In verse 2, it mentions all three members of the Trinity here. In verse 2, a lack chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Three members of the Trinity is mentioned there regarding salvation. All members of the Trinity worked to bring about our salvation. God the Father chose us before the foundation of the world. Folks, the Bible makes it clear, and I know people struggle with that. But we have to be faithful to the Bible. God the Son paid the price and ransom with his ultimate substitution the atonement sacrifice. God the Holy Spirit brings us to salvation and sets us apart, sacrifices us under the service of the Lord. Peter encouraged his readers by this strong declaration that they are chosen elect by God the Father and are so privileged it was nothing sparse about them or me or you if you're saved today. It's all of divine grace or what they have achieved and mark God's salvation. 
but their security and salvation rests in the free, merciful choice of Almighty God, according to the good pleasure counsel of His will. God, dear friends, is sovereign and free, and He does what He does. But so many people, in their stinking pride, think God is obligated, God owes them something. But in reality, folks, God does not owe anybody anything. The only thing all of us deserve is God's justice because we have offended many times God's law. Valued, sinned against them, which is abhorrent, which is repulsive of a holy God. It is a miracle that even one person is saved by God's wonderful grace. So Peter encourages them, they're chosen. Keep going. Peter encourages them in verse 4 there's a place in heaven reserved for you. But to move on very quickly here, this term foreknowledge of God needs to be cleared up as well. It says here, an act according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This word foreknowledge refers to God's eternal, predetermined, loving, saving intention. It's the same as when Peter preached the Pentecost, it said about that God had predetermined his son to go to a cross before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Foreknowledge does not suggest that God merely knew ahead of time in the future that we would believe and therefore chose us as if salvation depended on us which makes salvation complete out of God's hands a potential salvation instead of actual salvation. This makes man sovereign over salvation, not God, and makes God to be a weak begging God. Dear friends, I truly believe in the authority of God's word. God will save his people from their sins. God cannot fail. We quote the verse, the people fully understand it. It says that Christ will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It tells us in Isaiah that the Lord will be pleased with the travail of his soul. Some good people, do not get me wrong, have misunderstood this word for us. As they attribute it in just to foresight or supernatural knowledge of the future. But this word, dear friends, goes far beyond that. This word foreknowledge is pronosis in the Greek, which means to set one's love on a person or persons in a personal way. It is used regarding the nation of Israel. Did Israel choose God? No, God chose them and the wickedest nation of all. Amos 3 it says, You only have I known of all the families of the earth referring to Israel. God said as an act of love in a personal way in the nation of Israel. It is the same principle when the scriptures reminds us that Adam knew his wife Eve. It was an intimate personal relationship, not just I have knowledge of her. In contrast, Jesus said to the false professing religious people at the end of the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew 7, I never knew you. Personal, intimate relationship, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The Lord knew them because he is omniscient, but he did not know them personally in an intimate, personal way. So when you measure foreknowledge in scriptures, salvation foreknowledge involves God predetermining to know someone by having an intimate, saving relationship, by choosing them from eternity past to receive his redeeming love. And folks, it is mind-blowing, it's the mystery of God, of course. Don't you get caught up thinking, oh, am I the elect of God? Am I the chosen of God? No, you're called to come. Don't get through him up in, in the election. You're still called to come. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Come unto me, O you of labor and having them, and I give you rest. We leave the mysteries to God, the sacred things belong to the Lord. But none of 
Spirit. And it says here in Ephesians 1, according as he has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God calls his people to live godly lives. That is the purpose. We're not alone. We're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is God's. You see, he's chosen us before the foundation that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And this is so compatible, so compliant, so relevant, how it links to verse 2. A lack according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Holiness to the Lord set apart unto God, set apart unto holiness, unto obedience and strengthening of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. We're chosen of Christ to live obedient, godly, holy, Christ honored and Christ centered, Christ glorified lives. And when people don't, we have to question whether they're truly there or not. We were looking at Corinthians the other night, we studied First John, we studied James to show the true believer from false. The true believer does not continue on and practice sin. There's times we can fall, but we don't practice sin. We walk in the light, we walk in the spirit, we walk in faith, we walk in holiness, we walk in purity, we walk in love. You see, God has chosen us in Christ. To live holy, obedient, godly, Christ honoring, Christ centered, Christ glorifying lives, as the Spirit of God continues to sanctify us and conform us to the image of God's glorious Son, the blessed God Jesus Christ. With God the Father, I was saved when He chose me before the foundation of the world. With God the Son, I was saved when He died for me on the cross. With God the Holy Spirit, I was saved. When it came to fruition, by the power of the Spirit, convict me and bring me to that point when I heard the gospel and received Christ as Lord and Savior. You cannot separate the Godhead as it took the three persons to bring me to salvation. If you deny divine election on human responsibility, it leads to mercy, dear friends, because both are taught in the Bible. And God is the only one who can harmonize it perfectly. We can't. But nevertheless, Peter was encouraging him. Peter was inspiring him. Peter was informing him that they're elect. You're chosen. You're God's possession. You belong to Christ. And you're going to glory in verse 4 to an inheritance and corrupt it along the fire that faith has gone away and served in heaven to you. What an inspiration. What an encouragement it is to any believer, whether you're going through persecution or whether you're rejoicing in the Lord, whatever it may be. Folks, worldly strangers, pilgrims passing through our true destination, our true citizenship is in glory. I wonder today, have you come? Don't get hung up. A man in the elect, that doesn't matter. You're called to come. Have you humbled yourself? Have you truly repented and received Christ as Savior? Folks, it's great to be saved knowing that you're a child of God. Knowing whatever happens in this world, God is sovereign and God will bring us home in glory. I trust today you have that assurance that you're in Christ. That there is a place reserved in heaven for you. May the Lord bless his work to us.